it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. John McCarthy. A little bit of background on him. He got his BS in biology at the University of California, Irvine, followed by his MS at California State Fullerton, and then his PhD in exercise physiology at the University of Oregon. Uh, he is currently an associate professor in the physiology department um, here at UK. Um, but let me see, three, three postdocs? No, two no, postdocs. Well, yeah, there's actually just one, but two. Oh, well, okay. Yeah. But it has <laughs> University of Missouri. Yes. And he was also a postdoc fellow at my alma mater, yep. the University of Illinois. So when I say Papa Dell's Pizza, best pizza in the world, he probably knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, well, without further ado, okay. can we have some more? Absolutely. Uh, they don't stick on this. All right, so, um, so last night at about 10 o'clock, I decided to change the talk. Uh, I, I put it together and I was going to talk about novel roles for satellite cells in muscle hypertrophy, and then I realized that um, it probably would put you guys to sleep. So uh, I changed it to um, using genetic mouse models uh, to study adaptations to exercise, all right? So uh, my background is on exercise physiology. Um, I got into doing research um, just because I wanted to try to understand how do your muscles uh, hypertrophy. And the idea was if I understood that, um, then I could reverse <coughs> engineer the most effective way to train. And so I've always been really interested in uh, the molecular biochemical level of trying to understand hypertrophic growth. And so in my lab, we have a number of different projects that are ongoing. Um, so I'll talk to you today about the role of satellite cells in hypertrophy. We're also interested in understanding um, satellite cell dynamics. So how many people know about satellite cells? Two, three, okay, three. Uh, okay well, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of background on them. Um, the other thing that I'm interested in is uh, the role of uh, ribosome biogenesis, right? So at the simplest level, uh, hypertrophic growth um, is an increase in protein synthesis relative to protein degradation. The ribosome, right, is responsible for translating, making protein. So uh, during hypertrophic growth, um, if you have more ribosomes, you increase protein synthesis. Um, and the thought is, is that you're going to have an increase in muscle mass. So we're really un interested in trying to understand the molecular mechanisms that regulate ribosome biogenesis during muscle hypertrophy. And then uh, an area that I'm actually really interested in um, but it's been really challenging is the notion of ribosome specialization. So uh, historically, people have always believed that the ribosome is the same between different cell types. Um, and there's some logic to that, because the ribosome right, is responsible for translation. So you wouldn't think that you would need different types of ribosomes. However, over the last four or five years, it's emerged that maybe ribosomes are different between different cell types. And so my lab was trying to figure out if that, again, has a role uh, in muscle hypertrophy, because that's, not, that's what I'm interested in. So, um, so for today's talk, I want to talk to you about a system that people use to manipulate gene expression in the mouse. Um, pretty much all the work that I do in my lab is with mice. Um, so I do have people come into my lab who are interested in muscle hypertrophy, um, and then they uh, realize that they're never going to see a human being, um, and it's not for them. Uh, but this system, hopefully I'll be able to explain it to you guys, uh, and it's a really powerful system, and this is why we use the mouse um, to study muscle hypertrophy. I'll give you an example of how we use the Crelock system to uh, ablate or eliminate all the uh, satellite cells in your muscle, in mouse muscle. And the, the idea behind presenting you guys uh, these genetic mouse models, or this tool, is that it allows us to understand muscle plasticity at a very fundamental level. Um, and I think 
hopefully you'll see that we asked a very simple question um, and in trying to answer that question uh, we uncovered some novel roles for satellite cells. Okay, so how did uh, I get involved uh, looking at the role of satellite cells in muscle hypertrophy? So um, I came here back in 2004, around 2007, um, Karen Esser, uh, who I worked with initially, uh, was invited to do a, a point counterpoint for a journal of applied physiology, and the question was, are satellite cells necessary for, or obligatory for muscle hypertrophy? Um, and I have to say, before I got involved with this debate, um, I actually was going to study the role of satellite cells in muscle hypertrophy because I actually thought they were critical for hypertrophic growth. So we, of course, being, if you know Karen, you took the counterpoint. Um, so we were going to take the position that they weren't necessary. So she asked me, do you want to do this? I did it. So I started actually really looking at the primary literature um, that supported the idea that satellite cells are important for muscle hypertrophy. Um, and I was shocked. I was like, oh, this is bad. So these studies had some significant limitations. Um, and so I actually became a convert that maybe satellite cells actually aren't um, necessary for hypertrophy. And what I've highlighted is sort of the conclusion. So they put out their point, we put our point, and then we countered each other, and then we kind of came to some kind of consensus. And the general consensus was that the techniques that were, had been used in animal models to try to determine if satellite cells are required for hypertrophy had significant limitations. So we needed to develop a new way to uh, address the problem. So this is just kind of background in terms of what are satellite cells. So satellite cells are, there's different stem cell populations in your in skeletal muscle, but the, definitely the most prominent is uh, satellite cells. So they reside, um, so this is your myofiber. They reside just outside of the uh, membrane of the muscle cell. That's why they're called satellite cells. But they are um, the stem cell population in your muscle responsible for regenerating your muscle. So this, that point is pretty much um, uncontroversial. If you, and I'll show you some images, if you ablate satellite cells um, in a muscle, in a mouse, um, and you injure that muscle, that muscle will be unable to regenerate in the absence of satellite cells. So this, this is pretty much um, as, as close to fact as you can get. Um, in hypertrophy, which is what I'm interested in, is so here is your muscle fiber, uh, these are satellite cells, right, that reside just outside of the muscle cell, and all these little blue dots are myonuclei, right? So muscle cells are multinucleated, which is a really unique property. It's kind of fascinating why they are. Nobody knows, but people think they know. But in any case, when you subject a muscle to a hypertrophic stimulus, what happens is these satellite cells, these stem cells, which are normally quiescent, become activated, they proliferate, and amazingly, they actually fuse in to the muscle fiber. And in that, they donate their nucleus, okay? So in my field, this is like every day, right? We talk about this all the time. I have friends who are outside of the field, and I'll be talking to them about the fusion of satellite cells, and they'll be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're telling me another cell fuses into another cell? I'm like, yeah, that's what happened. So it's, it's a, it's a really interesting phenomenon. Any case, people believe that this fusion of satellite cells is necessary for muscle hypertrophy. And then with aging, uh, the, the thought here is, you know, as you get older, um, you're, you lose muscle mass, sarcopenia. People have believed that as you get older, you lose uh, the stem cell population, which they have thought is necessary for the maintenance of muscle as you get older. So as you lose those stem cells, they can't help maintain the muscle, and the muscle gets smaller. Okay, so why are satellite cells thought to be necessary for muscle hypertrophy? So there is the concept of myonuclear domain. So you have a muscle cell that's multinucleated. Each myonucleus is thought to govern or oversee a certain amount of the cytoplasm. All right, 
and we express this as uh, volume per mile nucleus. And during hypertrophy, right, as the muscle cell gets bigger, right, the volume increases to maintain that ratio, right, so how much area each mile nucleus is overseeing. It is thought that that's why you fuse in satellite cells. So you increase the number of myonuclei, and then you maintain that ratio of you know cytoplasm to nucleus. Does that does that make sense? Right. So that's what people believe why satellite cells are absolutely necessary. Because the question is, there's no doubt that when a muscle hypertrophies, the number of myo the number of myonuclei increases as a result of satellite cell fusion. And so then people are, well, why does that happen? And the idea is that you're gonna maintain your mononuclear domain. So this is some of the evidence that I came upon when I started looking at, okay, so we know that you have an increase in mononuclear number as a result of satellite cell fusion during hypertrophy. So how can you really test that? So what they did back was this in 92, so 25 years ago. So this is just a, uh, uh, the degree of muscle growth, and I'll get into what the model they used in a little bit. But in any case, uh, so ablation is, so they get about 16% uh, increase in muscle, I think it's muscle weight, yep, all right? But then if they, they take that, they have another group of animals that they irradiate the lower limb of the, uh, the, the mice. And the idea is by irradiating that muscle, what you're going to do is you're going to induce DNA damage. Now that's only a problem if a cell has to proliferate, right? Well, remember that's exactly what happens with satellite cells. So they're typically quiescent. You subject them to something, you do a hypertrophic stimulus, they become activated, they proliferate. Well, if you've, in, if you've induced DNA damage, once they start to proliferate, they're gonna die, right? They're gonna hate the toast. So they said, okay, this is a way that we're gonna kill satellite cells. And sure enough, when they did that, they completely blocked growth. Well, if you think about it, you're like, all right, well, that seems really non-specific. Let me just hit, you know, a muscle group with a high level of radiation and then say that it's very specific to the satellite cells. So you're probably causing all kinds of different type of damage to the muscle. So you can't definitively say that the ability to not grow, right, following the radiation is because you killed the satellite cells. So, so at, at, after I finished that, that debate, I was like, okay, I gotta come up with a way, I gotta figure out a way to specifically kill satellite cells in a mouse. And the system that we used is called the Prelog system. Some very, very smart people came up with this. Um, it's unbelievably clever. So there's two components. There's an enzyme called the Pre, which is a recombinase, and there is a DNA sequence right here. You don't need to remember it, but it's called LOXP. So what happens is if you have, this is to say a piece of DNA, all right, and you, we can through cloning, put a lox P site here and a lox P site here. And in the presence of Cre, Cre will literally cut out that intervening piece of DNA and stick it back together. All right? It's amazing. Um, oh, so because these are lox P, lox P sites and they're flanking a piece of DNA, we call it flocks, right? So we, we think we're pretty clever. We're like, oh, you got a flocks. You know, you'll hear us talk, oh, is that gene flocks? Meaning, did somebody go in, uh, a lot of cloning to do this, but they, I mean, there's literally hundreds, hundreds of mice in which people have inserted lox P sites into that gene. And then you'll see, hopefully, that now you'll understand how we can knock out a gene or turn on a gene, in the example I'll give you today, in any tissue we want, when we want, using this system, okay? So, now, so I, the first example I showed you is Cre. So if Cre, you know, once it's a protein, if it's in the, in the presence of DNA and that DNA has lots of P sites, it will excise the inter, 
intervening piece of DNA and stick it back together. Okay. Problem is you don't have control over pre when when you want it to do when you when you want to excise a piece of DNA. So some unbelievably smart people said, well, what we can do is here is our pre and this. NLS just means it has a nuclear localization signal, meaning it'll get transported into the nucleus. But what they did is they stuck on the end of the protein, again, by cloning. They took, this is so smart, they took, they have the estrogen receptor, right? And the estrogen receptor typically is um, uh, localized in the, in the cytoplasm, okay? So they took just the estrogen the light, estrogen ligand binding domain, okay? And they stuck it on the end of each end of the protein, okay? But then they said, well, wait a minute, we can't use the estrogen ligand binding domain of the estrogen receptor because well, there's estrogen in the system. So then they went in and they mutated just a single amino acid. Really smart. So now it doesn't bind estrogen, but it binds tamoxifen. Okay, and so what they're showing you here is, here is our, we call it, so that M means mutated ER, estrogen receptor, mutated, so we call it mer pre -mer. So this protein remains localized in the cytoplasm, bound to this other protein called heat shock protein 90, and it just stays there. And they're showing you here it doesn't bind estrogen. Okay, so I take that gene, and again, you do this through cloning, we call it the pre-ER, and then what you do is you take, this is TSP, tissue-specific promoter. So people have spent a huge amount of time, and, it, and muscle happens to be one area where they've done a lot of this, is people who were interested in embryonic development said, hey, we want to understand how do you, Right? You have the same genes in all your cells, and what makes one cell different than another cell is the genes that are expressed. And so how is it that the, say, myosin, right, myosin heavy chain, is only expressed in skeletal muscle? Well, it's done by its promoter. So people have to find these promoter regions for just about every tissue. So I take, you'll see, I use the human skeletal active promoter, and I put anything downstream of that promoter it will only be expressed in skeletal muscle. It's amazing. So you take your tissue-specific promoter and you have a drive expression of your pre-ER. So now my pre, okay, is only in the tissue that I want it, and I have control of when it becomes activated. So that will allow me to turn on or turn off a gene only in that tissue, only when I want. And that's really important for the research that I do because I'm interested in skeletal muscle and I'm interested in adult skeletal muscle. So I don't want a gene to be knocked out during embryonic development or postnatal development because that could affect how the muscle is as an adult. And so then if I go and study something in the adult, how do I know it's not secondary to something that occurred earlier on? The next is you have your gene of interest. This is this Rosa 26 site. This is a gene, they actually don't know what it does, but you can put anything in there and uh, use it to express, okay? And what they're showing you here is, this is a, uh, we call it a stop cassette, so it prevents transcription and it has locks P sites, okay? So you have one mouse that the pre is only expressed in your tissue of interest. You have another mouse that has a gene that has then flocks. You cross them together, you genotype them, you make sure that they have both of these uh, alterations in their genome, and then at a certain age you give them tamoxifen. Tamoxifen binds to the, the mer pre mer, translocates, dissociates from heat shock protein 90, goes into the nucleus, excises this stock cassette, which prevents transcription, and in this case, this is a reporter gene which makes this blue precipitate, you turn on that reporter gene, okay? So that is the system. And if you guys have any questions, please, I, I kind of try to keep the number of slides I have. Uh, 
I had like 45 when I first talked in, and I said, oh my God, put these guys to sleep. Um, that doesn't mean I'm not putting you to sleep right now. But, uh, so, so here are the mice that we used, that we came up with. We didn't make these mice. The beautiful thing in science is pretty much all, I've only made a handful of mice in my career. Most of the mice I get, other scientists have made. And I can email them, and people are more than happy to share their mice with me. And this, these mice cost about $30,000 a piece to make. So, right? It's like, so the fact that somebody's going to give me the mouse, it's, but again, most of the biomedical research that's done in the United States is done through the NIH, which is publicly funded. So in fact, if I make a mouse, like I made a mouse, I really don't own that mouse, right? So if a scientist calls me up and says, hey, I want that mouse, can you send it to me? I'll be like, yeah, I'll send it to you. As long as we're not, you know, we don't want to be doing exactly the same thing. Um, but we're fortunate because a lot of the mice I get, I actually get from people in the cancer field because I'm interested in cell growth, right? Muscle hypertrophy is cell growth. So a lot of the things that I look at, everything that everybody's trying to turn off in cancer, I'm trying to turn off. So they're always very happy to, sure, we're studying muscle hypertrophy, I don't care. <laughs> so in any case, we got this mouse from Charles Keller. Here is, this is a, just a cartoon of a gene called PAX7. PAX7 is really important because PAX7 is a transcription factor that is only expressed in satellite cells, okay? So remember, so now, I should tell you right now, the Cre is only expressed in the satellite cell. And they, I won't go into how they did it, it's really clever, but that, that's the gene. It's how they modified the PAX7 gene so that it only expresses Cre in the satellite cell. The next mouse we used was somebody knocked in to this Rosa 26 site, all right, Gene, they knocked in this cassette. And so what it is is basically here's our stock cassette. I made these little red lines. Those are our LOX P sites and the gene, the diphtherium toxin, all right? And then, again, we have two mice. We cross them. Pre gets activated. It removes the stock cassette, and now we get diphtherium toxin turned on. And kills yourself. It's brilliant, right? And it wasn't my idea. I actually got it from people who were using the system to kill like illegal dendrocytes in the brain because somebody wanted to know what their role was. So here is just a kind of summary of that. We have one mouse, it's PAC7 pre ER, second mouse, the Rosa 26 DTA. We cross them together, they're pups, we genotype them, and just for simplicity, we call that our PAC7 DTA mouse. We allow these mice to get fully mature, about four months of age. We give them tamoxifen for five days to activate the CRE, to turn on the diphtheria toxin, to kill the satellite cells, all right? And when we came up with this, we were really excited, and then I had written a grant, and I got the reviews back, and the reviewer was like, this will never work, because satellite cells are so quiescent right, when they're just resting, that they won't, they metabolically can't even support this activity, which I was like, crap, I didn't even think of that. So we were really nervous, but I'll show you in a minute. So here it is, I stole this slide from my uh, former graduate student, Tyler. So let's see if I can walk through it. So here's our PAC-7. We make our pre-ER. Uh, it is held in the cytoplasm. There's a nucleus, so we're out here in the cytoplasm. It's held in the cytoplasm because it's bound to heat shock protein 90. I give tamoxifen. I can never do this. And then tamoxifen can translocate into the nucleus. He has little scissors, shows it cuts out the stop cassette, and then he gets expression of his DTA. Um, he gets the theory toxin protein made, and then it prevents protein synthesis in the satellite cell, and then the satellite cell ends up dying because it can't synthesize the protein. Okay, so here it is. Um, how effective were we were? So what you're looking at here is a muscle on cross-section, and then what we did is we did immunohistochemistry for PAC-7, right? So this is our way of saying how, because remember, PAC-7 is only expressed in satellite cells, 
So wherever our antibody binds, as long as it co-localizes with a, a nucleus, we know it's a satellite cell. So what there's every little uh, white arrowhead is a satellite cell, and you can see vehicle. Think that's the, like your control, your wild type, your normal situation, and tomography. And then here's the quantification. So it worked. We we're able to kill. And some animals, all satellite cells, but typically about 90% of the satellite cells we can ablate in the muscle. And this is just further characterization. Okay, so here is, remember I told you, we know that satellite cells are absolutely essential for muscle regeneration. So we wanted to confirm, all right, we, we think we've killed all the satellite cells, but let's do this functional assay. So what you have here, again, this is just muscle, on cross section, it's a tibialis anterior in front of your, it's in the mouse. So here's vehicle. Um, again, vehicle is sort of your wild type normal muscle. We inject either PBS and one TA or this barium chloride, which will literally just destroy the muscle all the way down to the basal land. I mean, it, it doesn't happen <laughs> normally. But in any case, after, I think this is after a week, you can see that the muscle is beginning to regenerate, okay? Now here is a tamoxifen. Again, that is a muscle that has 90% of its satellite cells gone. And you can see that regeneration is significantly compromised, right? It's just a lot of fibrosis. Okay, so the model that we currently use, hopefully we're gonna be changing, we've come up with a different model. This is a model that's been around for oh, 50 years. It's called synergist ablation. So here's, this is a mouse, here's the lower hind limb, you're looking at the dorsal aspect. Um, what we do is we go in and we remove the gastrocnemius, right, the big part of your calf. We also take out the soleus, which in the mouse is very small, and we leave behind just the plantaris muscle. And as a result of that, the plantaris now has to assume the functional duties of like the gastrocnemius, okay? So we refer to this as a mechanical overload. Um, and you get this very robust hypertrophy within a couple weeks. You can already imagine there's some limitations to this model. It's, uh, we like to say euphemistically it's super physiological. Um, but the reason that we use it is a lot of times, you know, uh, when you're trying to study some process and you're looking at the biology, you want to get the signal above the noise. And so this is so robust that when we start looking at certain things, signaling pathways or gene expression, we can get a very robust response. Um, and the nice thing is a lot, pretty much a lot of, if you guys probably if you're into hypertrophy, you know about like mTOR signaling and all of that, that was all discovered using this model and it's translated very well um, into humans, which is very reassuring to me because my brother asks me all the time what I work on. And I said, I study muscle, muscle hypertrophy in the mouse. And then he wants to know, does that translate to human beings? And I say, I hope it does. Either why, either why it's um, like the world's expert on mouse muscle hypertrophy. So, <laughs> um, in any case, so this is just a cartoon of that same process. Leave behind the plantaris. Here you have muscle weight control. This is synergist ablation, SA after one week, two weeks, three weeks. And so what you can see is there's almost a two-fold increase in muscle mass within uh, two weeks. And so we said, let's use, the, this is the most robust model of hypertrophy that we're aware of, animal model. So if there's ever a requirement for satellite cells, this, you would think you would need it in, in, using this model. So here's the results. So uh, we have muscle weight. And again, I just put up here vehicle to think of it as a wild type, you know, normal situation. Tamoxifen is satellite cell depleted. Here is just the sham, that's your control, your baseline. Uh, it's normalized for body weight. And so what you can see is whether you have satellite cells or not, the increase in muscle mass is identical. So this suggests that in fact you do not need satellite cells for muscle hypertrophy. And then we went out to six weeks um, and while it's not statistically different, it looks like maybe we would call this long-term hypertrophy. Um, and I'll, I'll show a little bit of data at the very end that actually when you go out to eight weeks, you do see that the hypertrophic response is blunted. 
when you do not have satellite signs. Okay, so this is just now, you know, muscle weight is sort of a crude indication of um, uh, increases in the cross-sectional area of the muscle cells, the muscle fibers. So what you have here, again, vehicle, tamoxifen, um, this is a muscle on section. What we've done is we stain the muscle membrane using a pro uh, an antibody against a protein called dystrophin, right? And so it basically just outlines the, uh, the muscle fiber, and then the blue is uh, we, we can stain uh, nuclei, okay? And then what we do is we actually go in and we quantify, we used to have to actually, um, students have to go in and literally trace all of these fibers and then get an area. And then what we do is we bend it. But I have a student who just, uh, he came into my lab and he was like, nah, I'm not doing that. Like, that's just crazy. He's a really smart guy, so he came up with an image analysis program. So now this is all automated. So now we can do it really fast. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, good on you. Any case. <laughs> but in any case, what I really want you to see is that, so what we did is we bend the, the fiber sizes uh, based on the cross-sectional area. And this just shows you that <laughs> Uh, there's no difference, it just focus on the open and the closed bars, that there's no difference uh, in the increase in um, uh, the size of the fibers between vehicle and tamoxifen. And that, because part of it, the people could just say, oh, well maybe they're the same way, but maybe there's more fibrosis, or maybe there's some type of, you know, the immune response is different. So this just shows you that the quality of the muscle is the same, that the hypertrophic response, at least at the level of the fiber appears to be the same whether you have satellite cells or not. So again, if you remember, one of the things, why do people always believe that satellite cells are necessary for muscle hypertrophy? Because remember the satellite cell is quiescent, you place a hypertrophic stimulus on the muscle, the satellite cell becomes activated, it proliferates, and then it fuses into the muscle fiber and donates its nuclei. And in that way, it increases, or the nucleus, I in trouble for that, um, donates its nucleus, and in that, it increases the number of myonuclei in the muscle, and then you're maintaining this myonuclear domain. That's why people believe that satellites are necessary. So what we do, we've done here, again, this is just a, a higher mag image. These are individual muscle fibers, and we've stained the muscle membrane with dystrophin, and then, Again, this used to have to be done by hand. You had to, these little blue spots are nuclei, and then you had to go through and you had to count the white arrowheads are nuclei that are counted inside the dystrophin boundary, so those are myonuclei. The yellow are considered outside of the muscle fiber. So then they, people did quantify this. And again, now Ewan has a program that will automate this. And it's, 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 it's just as good, if not better, than the human. Because there's a lot of times where you have to make a judgment call on whether that nuclear is in or out. In any case, sham, this is just, again, control. There's no difference in the number of myonuclei per fiber. I uh, would call that, I don't know, that's about 0 0.8, 0 0.9 nuclei per fiber. We, we can't count the whole muscle, right? Um, and what you see, what, and this is what you would expect, that with hypertrophy, after two weeks of synergistic ablation in the control muscle, you see this significant increase in the number of nuclei per fiber in the muscle. Exactly what we'd expect, and this is why, again, why people believe that satellite cells are necessary for muscle hypertrophy. But in our mice in which we gave tamoxifen and we killed 90% or more of the satellite cells, the number of myonuclei, as you would expect, because there's no satellite cells, remains the same, okay? So here is, um, and this is just to kind of further confirm that what's happening, what you see here is, it's kind of hard to see, these are, we can take muscle and we can isolate the individual muscle fibers. And then what we do is we stain the nuclei blue. 
All right. So again, here's a vehicle, here's tamoxifen with satellite cells, without satellite cells, after two weeks of synergistic ablation. And so we can count the number of nuclei per length of a muscle fiber, and then we make some assumptions about that the fiber is a perfect cylinder, and then we can calculate the area, the volume. So now what we're trying to do is we want to calculate myonuclear domain, right? Because again, the idea is the reason you need more nuclei when you have hypertrophy is you have to maintain that ratio of cytoplasm to nucleus, right? Each nucleus over, you know, oversees a certain amount of cytoplasm. So if the fiber gets bigger, there's more cytoplasm, so you have to have more nuclei. That's what the field believes. What this is showing here is myonuclear domain and uh, this is just in a control again. It's roughly uh, 30,000 microns squared, or cubed, cubed, yeah, cubed. And what you can see is in muscle that has no satellite cells that's undergone two weeks of synergistic ablation, the myonuclear domain is larger. Exactly what you would expect, right? Because the muscle got bigger, but you didn't add, because you had no satellite cells, you didn't add any more so, and so then now the question has become how one area that we're pursuing is how, you know, again, the presumption is that you need those extra nuclei to maintain. So you could ask, well, why do you need extra nuclei? Or why do you have to have myonuclear domain? People believe, think that uh, the transcriptional output has to be so high to, you know, each nucleus has a certain transcriptional output. And actually what they're, what most people believe is it has, if you look at the total amount of um, transcription of a particular nucleus, most of it, I'm happy to say, is uh, called ribosomal RNA, right? Or ribosomal DNA transcription. That is, um, ribosomal RNA is the RNA that makes up the ribosome. So, Estimates are like 60, 70, up to 80% of the transcriptional output of a nucleus is for making ribosomes. And remember, I told you, I think ribosomes are really important for hypertrophy because you have to increase your protein, your, your rate of protein synthesis, your translational capacity. And so that's why people have believed that you need those extra nuclei. Um, but apparently, you don't. So people have really not been happy about this um, in our field. And in fact, somebody just, uh, so we published this first paper back in 2011, and just last year somebody said they took exactly the same mice and they repeated our study exactly, they said, and they showed, in fact, when you ablate satellite cells, you don't get muscle hypertrophy. So all of a sudden I started getting all these emails from people asking me, well, there's really only 10 people in the world who really care about this. <laughs> so, so, yeah. I always tell students, you know, if you find somebody that, if you find a professor that you, you like what they're doing, just go talk to them because, like, my wife is tired of hearing me talk about this. I love to talk about it. I've heard if you didn't, but he's interested. In it. But in any case, so it turned out that this individual actually sent us all his data and said, hey, what's going on? And so we were genuinely wanted to really figure it out because you, you always have some degree of, you know, I hope, you know, you feel like you do your experiments to the best of your ability, but, you know, maybe we missed something. Um, and it turns out he wasn't interested in really trying to figure it out. He just wanted to know what our criticism was so that when he wrote the paper, blah, blah, blah. In any case, through him, we realized, so I told you we use mice that are four months old. And we're con they're considered to be completely mature. He used mice that were younger. So we went back and did the study in mice that were only two months old. And sure enough, if you get rid of satellite cells in a, a mouse that's still growing, they are unable to hypertrophy in the absence without satellite cells. So then the question becomes how, what, what is that transition? What's occurring in that transition? And what we just, should put it up here. We just got some evidence from one of the postdocs in the lab that in fact what we think is happening is that the myonuclei in a growing muscle 
they're already ramped up, right? That muscle's growing, so they're just cranking out ribosomes, we'd like to think. And so if, they, if you try to put an additional growth on them or a requirement to grow, they can't do it. Those, their resident myonuclei are already tapped out. And the only way they can ramp it up further is they have to get additional nuclei from satellites. Whereas in a, in a fully mature, their transcriptional output is less, so they have some room before they hit a ceiling so they can compensate. And in fact, we have, we have my student published a paper on that showing that the transcriptional output um, in muscle undergoing hypertrophy that does not have satellite cells remains elevated um, as a compensatory mechanism. Okay, so the last thing I want to say is, so we looked and everything, the, the hypertrophic response appeared to be very, very similar between whether you did satellite cells or whether you did not. Except when we went out further, okay, I don't, I don't have it up here. If you go out to eight weeks of synergistic ablation, the hypertrophic growth is blunted. And then we had done some uh, gene expression analysis, and one thing we noted is muscle that does not have satellite cells, while when it's undergoing hypertrophy, upregulates a huge number of collagen genes. So because of that, we went and looked at, this is looking at uh, the connective tissue, it's kind of an indication of fibrosis. And so what you get here is vehicle, control, tamoxifen, no satellite cells, and the, the red stain is, is an indication of how much connective tissue there is, the degree of fibrosis. And then it's quantified here, and you can see that at four weeks of center dysplasia, but really at eight weeks, the amount of fibrosis is significantly increased when you do not have satellite cells. And so we, what I was going to present to you today was the research based on this. And what we found out from this is that, in fact, what satellite cells are doing is they, when they become activated, they release these small little membrane-bound vesicles called exosomes. They're like 100 nanometers. But inside these tiny little vesicles, they carry um, microRNAs. Do you guys know about microRNAs? Okay, microRNAs are tiny, as the name suggests. They are 22 base pair long uh, RNA molecules. And what they have been shown to do is they repress or prevent translation of particular mRNAs. And so what we found was that when a satellite cell becomes activated, it releases these exosomes. And inside the exosomes are these microRNAs. These exosomes literally go and fuse to neighboring fibroblasts, release their microRNAs, and they downregulate the production of collagen. And so in that way, they are helping to ensure the remodeling that goes on during hypertrophy that it doesn't become excessive and lead to fibrosis. So now, when satellite cells are no longer there, right, they are unable to signal to their neighboring fibroblasts, hey, hey, don't make so much collagen. I mean, you gotta make more of it, not too much. Um, and as a result of that, you get fibrosis. We found that you only need, it, you only need satellite cells during the first week of hypertrophy. And if the satellite cells are there during the first week of hypertrophy, and then we kill them, we rescue the hypertrophic growth, and we rescue the um, fibrosis. And so we actually think that the, 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 the blunted hypertrophy that we see is a result of the fibrosis. That is actually, we don't know this definitively, but our, our working model is, is that um, you're literally restricting um, the, the growth of the fiber because it's got all this connective tissue around it. Okay, so I wanted, this is the last thing I'll show you and then we'll be done. So this is a different system. Maybe when I come back in another two years, I'll, I'll teach you guys. We guys can congratulate by then. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> if I see you in a couple of years. <laughs> hey, this is a system. It's a, a different uh, system to regulate gene expression called the TEDON system. <clears throat> and we developed a mouse that allows us to overexpress genes of interest only in skeletal muscle. And what you get, again, this is a single fiber. And what we were able to do is overexpress this, it's called H2B GFP. It's a histone. It gets uh, incorporated into the nucleosome. It's part of the DNA. And so it's nuclear localized. 
And what you can see here is we're able to label all the myelonuclei. I think that's awesome. This just shows the co-localization of, this is DAPI, which stands for DNA, and shows you that all the GFP co-localizes. So this is kind of where we're going. This allows us, the idea here, we can now, we can isolate these nuclei and start looking at them, all that kind of stuff. Okay, so quickly I just want to acknowledge, so my long-term collaborator, Charlotte Peterson, she's over in the College of Health Science, so we've been doing this together now since 2008. Um, uh, Mitsunari, he is the guy who did a lot of the work that I showed you. He was a postdoc, he's back in Japan, has his own lab. Jothi did a lot of the immunohistochemistry. And Chris Fry and Tyler, who's my former graduate student, he was a postdoc, uh, they did a lot of the work, almost all of the work, defining this novel role for satellite cells. And with that, I'll finish, and if you guys have any questions, I'll see if I can answer them. All right. Yeah. Um, do satellite cells have other components that a typical cell would have, like mitochondria? Yeah. 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 I mean, it's a it's a normal cell. It, it, it is technically considered a stem cell, so it has everything that any you know all the organelles that any cell would have. Yeah. 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 All right. That means I did a really good job. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, guys.